Welcome back, everybody. Hope you learned some things from our exhibitors. All right. We've fielded a lot of questions about nutrition. Um, there's a lot of good resources on nutrition. I think Dr. Zook is going to talk to us about other risk factors in this last session. And then don't forget to hang around for lunch and you can continue asking questions at the table, get resources from each other. And um, any other housekeeping things? We have a lot of questions here. We're probably not gonna get to all of them. Thank you for the questions and take it away. So I don't know if I have an hour and 15 minutes of talk left in me. I've never talked this much at one spot, but um, it's worth every minute to get the feedback and the questions. It just means a lot to me that you're listening and that this seem, the message seems to be landing. So I really appreciate that. Um, and um, towards the end, we'll uh, ask for uh, lots more questions. So be sure you write them down, bring them forward, or just raise your hand. and. Someone will pick them up. We appreciate you folks online, and we want to honor your questions as well. So please send them forward, and we'll be sure to get some of those answered. And you know, if you submit questions with your name, uh, email, and a phone number, we'll try to answer them even after the fact when this conference is over. We did that uh, a year ago. We answered every one that we could find. Uh, and so we're willing to do that. But you know, if you have a question, other times, we'd be thrilled if you just called the Dementia Resource Center and, what about this? I mean, you have a burning question, feel free to do that. Uh, I'm not there every moment, but uh, someone usually is, and if the person answering the phone can't answer the question, they'll get in touch with somebody who can. So, uh, just so you know that. So our last session is gonna be talking about um, risk factors. So here we go. So uh, as I said, we like to go upstream to the cause of dementia. And if we do that and we can effectively change something that had to do with causing your dementia symptoms, uh, that's what we want to do. But you know, before Alzheimer's disease pops out and gives you symptoms, it's still Alzheimer's disease. But we just don't do brain biopsies to prove that in living people. So, we don't know if for sure you have Alzheimer's disease 20 or 30 years before it actually pops out. And as I said, I don't think the medicines that we have for it are very effective. Even the new UMAB drugs, they all end in UMAB. Uh, and so let's work on what risk factors we can dig up. And the ones that are fixable, let's try to fix them. And that's kind of our strategy. And that's the strategy we think all dementia care should follow. We think when you do a drug study on 10,000 people, you need to get all the risk factors down to zero as low as possible before you give them the drug or the placebo. They don't do that. They might control for smoking if you're a man or a woman or your age, but they don't control for all these things. Well, I could stack the uh, placebo group with all the sleep apnea people, the smoke, and do, never exercise and make my data look pretty good with my experimental drug. So uh, whenever they do drug studies, did you control for all the known dementia risk factors should be the first question. And they should get everyone's dementia risk factors fully assessed and modified and six months down the road, then enter them in the study, but they don't do that. And I think that's part of the reason why the studies are not consistent. And it's hard to get consistency in dementia studies where it's multifactorial. When you want to get a grant for a study, they only want you to study one thing. Well, dementia isn't that way. It's 20 things, you know, and that's not the way our system works currently. But if you look at all the list of risk factors, the most common ones, the ones that do lend themselves to fixing, I've listed them here. Hypertension has to be right at the top of the list, but why did you get hypertension at age 35 when you're a teacher and you have to work on the weekends to make ends meet and so forth, and you have to work two jobs all summer instead of taking the summer off? Well, let's look at that. And why did you get hypertension? Is your nitric oxide low? If it is because you don't eat any green leafies, maybe that'll help. 
You know, this, um, the one doctor here, um, it's, uh, yeah, Richard Johnson, the one that wrote uh, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, he did studies on teenagers who were obese and had high blood pressure. And they, were, they didn't have renal artery stenosis or any of the anatomical causes. They just had high blood pressure. They didn't exercise. They were sedentary by and large. They were obese and they had high blood pressure, brand new. And he said, let's measure their uric acid. And a lot of them had way elevated uric acid. They treated the uric acid with allopurinol and their blood pressure went away. I never heard that before, but that was a study he did in the last couple of years. Now, if you leave the blood pressure there until they're 20 or so, it doesn't work. But if you get it right away, when they first start showing hypertension, uh, you treat the uric acid. In other words, you're allowing more nitric oxide to come back and your blood pressure goes away. How you treat uric acid isn't so much with allopurinol, although that works, but it's to get rid of the sugar. If you can convince the child to not eat sugar and high fructose corn syrup, that's probably a good first step, but they don't do that. They give you a placebo or they give you the antihypertensive medication. So hypertension doesn't necessarily have to be hypertension. If you can go upstream and get to the cause, that's even more important. It makes a lot more sense. But hypertension is so prevalent in our society. And you know, it turns out uh, one of these doctors talks about history of medicine. In the 1900s, early 1900s, just after 1899, you had to scrounge around hundreds of people to find enough people with hypertension to have a study. You couldn't find enough people with hypertension in 1900 or 1905 or 1910. You couldn't find people who had um, high blood pressure. You couldn't find people with elevated uric acid. They didn't have elevated uric acid. It was three or 3.5. Since then, we've changed our nutritional status. Did you ever see, and I bring this story up, and forgive me those of you who have already heard it, I love those pictures of workers in the 1800s taking the railroad out west, where they're in Wyoming, and you know it's like 97 degrees, and they've got their vests and their suit coat, and they're grimy from head to toe, but they're sitting there at grim with their pitchforks, and there's like, 30 or 40 of them, and there's not one that weighs more than 150 pounds, not one. They ate once a day with their grubby hands, and that's how they lived. Um, they, none of them probably had hypertension or high uric acid. Um, but if, fast forward to today, I love watching, I don't like to go to the state fair because there's no place to sit down. <laughs> I don't like that. But I love to watch the newsreel and say, oh, we had the state fair, we had 100,000 people, and they show gobs of people. And there's hardly any of them that are normal weight or less. Well, I guess you go there to eat to begin with, right? But how do you eat a turkey leg standing up? I don't know how they do that, but um, times are changing. And the people who make the standards for our diet are doing it for financial reasons. And I don't know how we got into that, but. Every VA hospital in the country has to serve food based on the standards that the USDA set. That's a lot of food. When I go to the nursing home and I see people eating, it's noodles, potatoes, mac and cheese, cookies, cookies, and did I mention cookies? You know, I'd love to do a study, and I'd love to get a grant to do a study where we take average 100 people in a nursing home and we get to say what they eat. And first of all, you have to find 100 people willing to do that, and it'd be complicated. But I'd like to see just how things change at the nursing home when we give them the ideal diet, even people in their 70s and 80s. I'd love to see the results of that. So if anybody wants to donate a couple million dollars for that study, let me know. <laughs> Uh, but because it's not going to get a blockbuster, multi-billion dollar profit drug, that study won't happen in America, I guarantee you. So, um, and um, cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease is an interesting disease. I've had uh, acquaintances who run marathons get a quadruple bypass. Why does someone who never smoked, runs gobs of miles, runs marathons, 
get, need a coronary artery bypass graft for coronary artery disease, that which gives you heart attacks. Why would that be? Well, it, partly genetics, but, um, and partly, and most of them have like way normal cholesterol. And by the way, did you know that the majority of people coming into the emergency room for the very first heart attack, the majority of them have normal cholesterol? And 15% of them have way normal cholesterol. Even the extreme that the specialists recommend, 15% of them. And there they are with their first heart attack. So cholesterol is not the only reason you get a heart attack. It's inflammation. The vessels are inflamed. What's bad for the ve blood vessels is bad for the brain. And there's a connection there. Vascular health depends on things like uric acid and nitric oxide that we talked about. And that's why I chose those, because they're all tied together and they're all part of the same syndrome, if you will. And we call it metabolic syndrome, but I mean, there's other names for it. But it involves blood sugar and, and so forth. But um, vascular turns out to be a really important risk factor because if you already have a vascular disease, even if you're a young person, um, that's um, a risk factor for dementia later on. Now, if you get it attended to, you get your blood pressure down and in the normal range, and you do all the other things. You can't just medicate your way out of health into, into cardiovascular health. You also need to keep your weight down. You need to exercise. You need the stress relief. If you're stressed out of your guard all day, every day, and we see this with caregivers, we worry about caregiver stress, and that needs attention. And that's why we say we don't want to extract the patient as an individual case outside of their milieu. Their milieu is the whole family, especially the caregiver. Being a caregiver for more than a year for somebody that you love with dementia is a really high risk factor for dementia yourself. So caregivers of a loved one that they love dearly, and this is not commercial caregivers, for more than a year for dementia has way elevated risk for dementia themselves. That's how stressful it is. So, and we've seen people who've been caregivers for eight or 10 years. It's amazing. Um, and then atrial fibrillation. You know, I, I want to get my cardiology friends and colleagues on track with the importance of atrial fibrillation looking forward into risk for dementia. You know, the big thing about atrial fibrillation, it's an irregular heart where your heart beats, the interval between each beat is different. So it's bup, 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 It's all irregular. And it's fairly common in people our age, 65 and above. But atrial fib allows your blood to sort of pool in the atria. And if your atria are big, uh, because you're a marathon runner, you're more likely to get clots in there if you go in and out of atrial fib. And so quite often, uh, they're treated with anticoagulants so you don't get stroke. But even so, when we see the scans of people who have this back history of atrial fib, they have this white matter vascular abnormality on their MRI scan, which is indicative of little tiny strokes going on. Now, if you have a big stroke and you're paralyzed and you're blind and you go to the emergency room, that's a big stroke. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about little tiny strokes in a shower of clots of maybe two or 300 red blood cells clots into your brain in multiple areas. You don't get paralysis. You don't get blindness. You don't get the typical stroke thing where your arm comes down. You just get cognitive dysfunction. And I think this is a big deal, and I don't think it's solved yet, but I really worry about atrial fib being attended to fully, completely, and as carefully as you can. And um, in the old days, we used an anticoagulant called Coumadin. And there are people with artificial valves who must take Coumadin because the new expensive anticoagulants aren't indicated. And when you take um, Coumadin for years and years, Coumadin works by binding your vitamin K. And vitamin K keeps calcium from forming in your arteries and heart valves. So when you take Coumadin for 30 years, your valves are calcified, your arteries are calcified, proving the necessity of vitamin K. But atrial fib, I really worry about it contributing to dementia if it's not fully taken care of. And when I see people are left in atrial fib, the left in atrial fib bothers me. If there's any way we can uh, change the electrical system, an ablation or some other thing, if it's feasible, 
um, I would think it's well worth the chance because atrial fib puts you at risk for little baby clots that go everywhere. And I don't, I don't know if we pay enough attention to that. Peripheral vascular disease, there are people, especially smokers, who the arteries in their legs and other places are constricted when they exercise and the muscles call for more oxygen, the vessels can't provide, they get pain in their leg when they walk, that's called claudication pain. That's a vascular disease and that too has a risk for dementia. What's bad for the blood vessels is bad for the brain. By the same token, what's good for the blood vessels is good for the brain. So the glass is half full or half empty, depending on how you look at it. Um, <clears throat> and sleep apnea, you know, atrial fib and sleep apnea, I consider them cousins. If you have sleep apnea, you've got a 50% chance of having atrial fib somewhere along the line, if you're our age. If you have atrial fib, you've got at least a 50% chance of having sleep apnea. And as I said before, half the people with sleep apnea don't know they have it. And so if I was a doctor treating some brand new atrial fib patient, I'd recommend either a sleep study or a screening test for a sleep study because 50% chance my older adult patient has sleep apnea that's unattended, damaging their brain every night that that goes on. So I look the two as very important. If someone gets new atrial fib, they should get a test, at least a screening test. You can wear an oxygen measuring overnight, and if your oxygen stays 98, you're golden. If it goes down to 80, you better get a formal sleep study and get treated. Very important. It's a very remediable problem that contributes to a lot of dementia in this country. Other sleep disorders, REM sleep behavior disorder. How many of you have heard of that? REM sleep behavior disorder. It's a significant risk factor for dementia. And what it is, is when you sleep, when you're in your dream, your REM sleep, you're paralyzed. There's something that happens in your brain that paralyzes you. So even when you're punching the guy and kicking him, your arms don't move because you're paralyzed. Well, that doesn't work in some of us. And then you punch your spouse or whoever's in the bed with you, you kick and you thrash around and sometimes you fall out of bed. REM sleep behavior disorder. And there are treatments for it and it's recommended that they be treated. And if it is suppressible with medication, there's a benzodiazepine, but before that they try melatonin, but way higher doses of melatonin. They start with three, six, nine, they go up, uh, much higher doses to treat REM sleep behavior disorder. And it's unclear to me if treating it lessens your risk for dementia, but it looks like it might, and since it's fairly harmless uh, reason to treat that. But REM sleep behavior disorder is also a marker for Parkinsonism and uh, a kind of dementia called Lewy body dementia. It doesn't mean you're doomed to get it, but you, you have to start watching for that. And there are many other sleep disorders that young 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds get, and studies show that if those are unattended, unfixed, your risk for dementia goes up. So sleep disturbances, and we have sleep doctors, and I forget what the fancy name for sleep doctor is, there's a fancy name, so you have to have a name for everything that's difficult. But anyway, they will analyze your sleep and help you with strategies for sleep. They don't just do tests of the, for sleep apnea. They do, they'll talk to you about good sleep hygiene and how you, you, know, you wanna have your room totally dark and you wanna have a, a, a nightlight that isn't blue color because blue color makes you wakeful. Uh, how if you have a nightlight, it should only come on when you move. It shouldn't be on, you want it dark, you want it cold, it should be 10 degrees colder than the rest of your house if you can. That's sleep hygiene. And there are specialists that can talk to you about that. But if you have a 30 or 40 year old child and their sleep is very disturbed, have them get it evaluated and get it taken care of because that contributes to brain malfunction later. So sleep apnea and sleep disorders. And then you get into the whole thing of diabetes. Now we have lots of words that sort of mean diabetes. Insulin resistance is the general chemistry where insulin doesn't work driving sugar into cells, basically is what insulin resistance is. And insulin resistance in your brain is almost universal in every single Alzheimer's patient. Now I'm saying Alzheimer's on purpose because there are other dementia, it's been shown more in Alzheimer's than the others, but probably to some degree has an effect where the brain cells don't get to utilize 
fuel, which is glucose. And if the insulin isn't doing it, the insulin may be impaired. And generally in these people, their insulin level is very high because the insulin is being pumped out to try to do more and more. And how much insulin you have generally will do the job if you have enough of it. But at a point, it's diminishing returns and your blood sugar starts to go up and you have diabetes. I think 90% of type 2 diabetes, and most diabetes, 90% of it is type 2, and there are exceptions, but most of it, 90% is curable with behavioral management. If I, and I kid my colleagues about Dr. Zook's Desert Island, where I'd like to just take some people there and drop them in by helicopter, and um, they can only eat what I tell them, they have to exercise, and every night we sing Kumbaya and tell stories around the campfire. And if we did that, we could get rid of 90% of type 2 diabetes, I'm convinced. Now, that implies a lot of things, that they are compliant, that they don't have other medical complications and so on, but they never taught us that in medical school. They just said, what drug are you going to use? What drug? Wait until the downstream problem occurs, and we can lower your blood sugar with very expensive drugs but we didn't get to the cause of it. If we send you to the island and you get the island treatment, you don't need any pills 90% of the time. And wouldn't that be better? But diabetes is so much a part of dementia or pre-diabetes or almost diabetes. We have all these classifications. If you're fasting, sugar is much above 100. You're probably in that range. Some people think any fasting blood sugar above 90. It's all over the chart. But the higher your fasting sugar, the more likely is the problem. But what do doctors do to detect diabetes? They do a fasting sugar. Well, that's the last thing that goes haywire. You could have the pre-diabetes for several years. The first thing that happens is your insulin level changes. So your fasting insulin level is sky high long before your fasting blood sugar is abnormal, long before your A1C goes up. A1C doesn't go up until your butt fasting sugar is high. Then the A1C goes up. So we've got it backwards. We always do either an A1C if we're really serious or we do a fasting sugar. But what really goes haywire first, the first warning sign of diabetes is an insulin, a fasting insulin that's elevated. Now we argue about what's normal. If you look on the normal for Centricare, it's way higher than I think it should be. And dementia circles, they argue about what's a normal fasting insulin. But anyway, if your blood test for diabetes is normal, that's great. But could you still have prediabetes? Absolutely. Look at the fasting insulin. And we recommend virtually every one of our recommendations, please do a fasting insulin. And only about half the time the doctors will do that. They've never done one. So they don't want to do it. Well, if I don't do it, it must not be important. But Fasting insulin is the first marker that's something. And we Americans, we want a, a for sure biomarker that tells us we have it. We don't want just doctors to accuse us of eating bad. You know, that's like subjective. We want a biomarker that proves we're eating bad. And so a fasting insulin would give you that. So we got through that. And then COVID-19. I really worry about the endothelial damage of COVID-19. Even a casual... I was sick for a little cough and I took Paxlovid. I worry about that. I worry that in the next 10 years, we're gonna see a lot of dementia. And I worry about the endothelial damage because what's bad for the blood vessels is bad for the brain. And I worry about that. And um, COVID is still out there. And then what about the next virus that comes along? What about the next mutation of COVID-19? I worry that we're gonna see a lot of problems and people have said you don't need to wear masks and all that. I think anything you could do to avoid getting COVID you should do. And uh, I think that's going to have a dramatic impact on the incidence, the prevalence of dementia in our community. So the endothelium is the lining of your blood vessels, the inside lining. The muscle part is on the outside, but the endothelium is critical. It's a it's almost like an organ system all on its own. It, it, it does things that open the artery when it needs to, to let in more blood, like when you exercise or run up the stairs, or to constrict when your arm gets too cold in the ice water, when you're trying to fish minnows out of the bucket and, it's, and you're ice fishing, <laughs> and it's supposed to contract. But when you don't have enough nitric oxide, it just sits there like porcelain. 
It doesn't dilate, it doesn't contract, it just sits there like porcelain. And it's hard to think about that when you're looking at that jelly donut at the coffee shop thinking, do I really need that, you know? But um, eating low sugar, low carb, I think when you hit age 50, it's great if you do that from then on, but I see kids eating way too much sugar. My grandkids eat way, they take syrup and put it on the plate and they get one of these, they call them waffles, they're like round things you put in the toaster and then you smear all the, and then the right on a bottle it says high fructose corn syrup. Well now they're bragging in the syrup. If you look down the syrup aisle, the maple, maple syrup, now it's not Joe Winter maple syrup, it's brown stuff that tastes like maple. Uh, they brag, no fructose, no high fructose corn syrup. They brag about it. And then they put some other awful stuff in there. And so they put corn syrup, which is pure glucose. But, um, but uh, diabetes and sugar and endovascular, the, the endothelial injury and damage, that's where it's at. And that's the basis of virtually all our chronic major diseases, blood vessel health or not. Blood vessel health or not, determines how your brain survives and how you get dementia or you don't get dementia. Or if you get dementia, it's when you're 89 instead of 69. What, what's wrong with that? You know, when you, and my friends will say, you can't prevent dementia because when they talk about the brain, they think in the absolute terms. Prevent means you never get it 100%. Well, we don't say that about coronary artery disease. We say prevention meaning maybe we delay it. I don't know why it got so that when we're talking about you know, dementia, it has to be absolute. Well, I call it prevention if I delay the onset by 10 years. I'm calling that prevention. If I delay it by two years, I'm calling that prevention. So um, that's why you know, a lot of people still say you shouldn't use the word prevention and dementia in the same sentence. We never did when I was in medical school because it was, well, we didn't talk about dementia. So sugar, do I need to say it, is really important. <laughs> We've hammered that beyond recognition. Um, and then in our interviews, we've discovered some really traumatic stories. Not everyone. You know, I mean, there are many people like me grew up in a loving family where everyone loves you. And you know, we didn't have everything, but we were happy. And, and not everyone has that. And what hurts you as a child, the event ends but the trauma lives on, and the trauma can live forever. Better that there would have been an intervention, even a medication intervention, right after the trauma, like they do for PTSD and soldiers. We didn't do that 30 years ago. We didn't do that 20 years ago. We didn't do that 10 years ago. And if it's way ago than that, we certainly didn't do it. And we see a lot of kids that grew up in uh, isolated, farmhouse and bad things were happening. And as soon as they were 18, the boys went in the service and left. The girls got married and left the farm and tried to get out of the abusive situation. The events ended, but the trauma lives on, especially if it's not attended to. And that really, I'm convinced, really hurts the brain. It really hurts the brain. ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences, that's what the ACE stands for. You can't go back and change history. Um, and maybe sometimes counseling stirs up a rat's nest of bad feelings. And, you know, a good counselor could help you through that. But, and a lot of people don't want to admit that they need to see a counselor. It's sort of a pejorative connotation, sort of like being lonely. You don't want to admit to it. And they're ashamed. And it's terrible how people who are abused feel ashamed and embarrassed and it shouldn't be so. They should feel entitled to go see the counseling that they need. And would it be nice if counseling was actually paid for, like it should be? It's not. And if it takes five months to see a counselor for a crisis, what kind of crisis care is that? Well, you can go to the emergency room, you know, with all the flashing lights. And But we need to do better on mental health. And mental health, if we don't take care of it, it's going to worsen and snowball in future generations. They're even talking in Paul Conti's book on trauma, uh, how the trauma goes down generations. The grandchild evidences the behavior reflecting the grandparent's trauma. 
Who would have thought? How, you know, and there are many people who break the cycle, who have to their credit, they were abused by their parents, but they don't abuse anybody. And that takes a lot of energy. And, but if then your child suffers the effect of your parents' trauma, that just doesn't seem fair. But anyway, they're writing about that. Why it's so important that we have a good counseling and mental health and behavioral health system that gets paid for. And you don't have to beg and plead and fill out insurance papers and get prior authorization and all the other rigmarole just so they don't have to pay for it. We're gonna pay dearly for not paying for mental health. And I think we might pay dearly if we don't figure out a way to fund dementia care. Infections, um, who would have thought that cold sores could lead to more risk for dementia? It's associated. We all get, not all of us, but a lot of us get sores in our mouth. And that's from the cold sore herpes. And that is found in the brains of many people who die with dementia. Now, association doesn't mean causation, but they're there. And the same with the shingles virus. The shingles virus is found in the brains of many people who get an autopsy of their brain who die with dementia. So you can get pills for cold sores. You can get the cream. The cream doesn't get in your brain. The pills do. And when you get shingles, uh, they can give you pills or not, depending on the doctor's preference. I'd say, please, doctor, give me the pills because I got a big patch of shingles. It's, it's hurting me. And it's not so much to get rid of the shingles, although it may help with that, but it's to, there's an association of that virus in the brains of people who die with dementia. Now remember, because it's there doesn't mean it caused it, but it's really suspicious. But what that chronic inflammation of a virus that hangs out in your brain, that inflammation does hurt your brain. Not so much in the infection model, like the pneumonia germ gives you pneumonia and you die, but just because it creates a chronic inflammation. In gum disease, uh, a recent lecture that I heard said that about half of us over 65 have inflammatory gum disease. And when you have an implant, the base of the implant's infected, about 20% of us. That's even worse because the nerve has been killed by the procedure and you don't feel pain when there's an infection there. So when my wife lost a tooth, it was in a place that didn't really matter so much uh, as far as chewing, the dentist referred us to uh, someone who does endodontics and so forth. I said, well, what's the harm if we leave it alone? He said, well, it shouldn't be any harm, but what kind do you want? I said, well, we don't want any. So we left a gap there. Because those implants do get inflamed. Not a lot, but 20%. I guess I'd, if I can live without the tooth, I'd live without the tooth. Now, if it's right in the front, okay, maybe you have to fill it in. But those do get inflamed, and even without all that, 50% of us have inflammatory gum disease. There's a germ in your mouth that most of us have called Porphyromonas gingivalis, and it's present in the brains of many of the people who get an autopsy who died from dementia. Porphyromonas gingivalis, they're even using it to, uh, in archeology, span there's not that germ, but other germs like it to follow when the first Americans came down the Bering Strait into, they're, they're following germs. It's, they actually use the H. pylori stomach germ. But uh, P. gingivalis is gonna be a, a major thing. And when you use the mouthwash uh, to kill it, you, you're killing the good germs as well. But Porphyromonas gingivalis makes a substance called gingipanes. And the gingipanes goes right up the cranial nerves into your brain and gingipanes stops you from eliminating the beta amyloid. And beta amyloid is what all these expensive drugs do to bind and get rid of. Well, ginger pains stops your ability to clear out your own beta amyloid. And they're trying to figure out gums and other things that gets rid of the ginger pains produced by porphyromonas gingivalis. Who would have thought a germ in our mouth could give us dementia? But P. gingivalis is there, and I think you're gonna read about that because there's gonna be gums and other products come out to try to get rid of it. But it's present in almost all of us. But there's good germs and there's bad germs in your mouth and it's a detente that goes on all the time. The microbiome of your mouth. It's a little different than the microbiome of your stomach where there's good germs and bad germs. You want to favor the good germs by giving them lots of fiber. That's a prebiotic, that means food that the good germs like. You give them lots of fiber, fiber and fiber 
They like garlic, they like onions, and the right foods makes the good germs in your intestine happy. And I'm not sure how you get rid of P. gingivalis, but I suspect they'll find out that P. gingivalis does some good things in your mouth. It's just keeping it under control so it's not out of whack. But infections, um, and you can argue about tick-borne diseases till the cows come home. I mean, they have two-week seminars on tick-borne diseases, Lyme disease, you're familiar with. Uh, Minnesota was a hotbed for years. Now we realize that most states have tick-borne diseases. But they're sneaky. You know, they're, they're different kind of germs. They're not like regular bacteria. And they can set up an inflammatory process in your brain that goes on and on and on, even when all the germs have been killed. So getting uh, repelling ticks and not getting bit by ticks makes a lot of sense. And when you do, and you got the bullseye patch, go get treated. And then do follow-ups to make sure you got completely treated. So germs, where else would germs be? Well, germs would be, um, in any cut or infection, but sneaky things. Um, some people with colitis have germs involved in that. There's, there's other places, but um, any, any infection, and we're talking probably for most of us, oral infections need to be treated. We see a lot of people with several teeth missing, and the ones that are, aren't looking too good, and they're probably inflamed. Uh, and I'm not sure every dentist is dementia informed, but how you deal with that could make a big difference. Do you know that Porphyromonas gingivalis is found in the coronary artery biopsies when people die of a heart attack? They find P. gingivalis in the artery wall. And this is something we've known for years. And other bacteria in the mouth are found in the walls of the little tiny arteries that keep our heart muscle alive. So it's, if you've got an infection, you want to get it cleared up. Toxic exposures. I could talk about Roundup. I've heard all day seminars on Roundup, which is glyphosate. And Roundup, when you spray it on your wheat product, just at the harvest, it makes the wheat mill a beautiful white flower that looks just really good. And then the chemists will say, oh, but the glyphosate, it's gone in 24 hours. No, it's not. Dr. Bredesen in California, who we try to emulate in our he, he's done blood tests on people, and virtually every one of his people had a measurable glyphosate level. And the people that were the worst tended to have the highest level, and so on. So just a word to the wise. You know, I go to my dear hardware store, and they've got stacks of Roundup in a pyramid, you know. When you spray that stuff, it gets absorbed through your skin. It hurts your brain. It's not good for your brain. Occupational exposure. People work in battery plants, or they recycle batteries. There's a lot of bad things that happen there, lead, cadmium. Uh, people who smoke have a lot of cadmium in their blood, and cadmium levels uh, can also lead to dementia. Mercury, uh, people who like raw fish and sushi. You know, my daughter and her husband love sushi, and they want a special treat. They go to a sushi bar, and they bring it home, and I say, you know, this stuff wouldn't be bad if you just cook it, you know? 400 degrees for about an hour, and it'd be just about right, you know, for me. But. But the bigger the fish, the more mercury they have. So a big tuna, big tunas are really big, and they have a ton. It's a, a food chain thing. The big fish eat the little fish, and then the bigger fish eat those fish. And, and by the time you're a 1,000 pound tuna, you've got a ton of mercury. And so I love tuna fish, but I don't want mercury. So toxic exposure. Service related, you've seen the burn pits that the service people, when they leave Afghanistan, they throw everything in a big pit and burn it and gives off these toxic fumes and God knows what's in there, but probably plastics and things like that were, and that's really bad for you. And we're gonna learn to shield our soldiers from that, but um, I worry about those kind of toxicity. Um, and then poor diet, well, we talked a lot about high fructose corn syrup, that's what HFCS is but sugar and sugar and sugar, and it's everywhere. Um, processed food you're gonna read a lot about. Processed food is anything that's not a whole food that didn't get plucked out of your garden. Uh, processed food is everywhere. In most of the food in the grocery store, the majority is processed. And I used to love to go to the deli and get that tavern ham slices, but boy, that's not good for you. And that's highly processed. And, 
You know, if you get a package of food and it says outdates in the year 2052, <laughs> what's that all about? You know, that's process, you know. So processed food you're going to read a lot about, and um, I think uh, you want to avoid the processed food. And I think it says dehydration. Yeah, and then what's after dehydration? Oh, vitamin deficiencies. We talked a little bit about vitamin deficiencies. Um, but you can get um, vitamin deficiencies for a number of reasons, mostly if you remove the acid in your stomach. But you know, if you watch um, o older people eat, they eat what's convenient, especially if they're one of the people living alone. What's convenient? Well, I can make mac and cheese. You know, mac and cheese, that mysterious orange stuff that coats the macaroni, I call it cheese-like substance. I'm not sure what's in there. Uh, and they eat that a lot because it's easy and toast, and donuts, and some of them drink milk, but they have to go to the store to get milk. So they have fruit juice, and, and it's a lot of carbs. And um, like I said, if I could get a research project and take people in the nursing home, give them the right foods that I would like them to eat, I'd be very interested to see what results they got. Uh, dehydration we did mention before, but if you eat a lot of salt, make sure you drink a lot of water. Because if you, people who have, live on a high salt diet often are overweight or fat. When you eat too much salt and you don't have enough water, you will be fat. And carbs, starches, you know, we didn't really get into that, but anything made from wheat or something like wheat, so that's bread and rolls. And you know, most of our sodium comes from bread and rolls. Only 11% of your sodium is dietary that you put the salt shaker on. The rest comes from our food. And bread and rolls has a ton of salt. Who would have thought? And sedentary lifestyle. Boy, you know, I, I see my, uh, my daughter's uh, girls are both very active, and their other children are very active. But a lot of kids sit around on their iPads and they're so entertaining. I mean, when we were kids, the shows were really dumb, like the so-and-so political party convention. Who wants to watch that? Or some guy talking about the news, whatever that was. And it was so bad, we just went outside and played baseball all day and ran and played. And our mother would drag us in for supper, wash our hands, and then we'd go out. But we couldn't go out until after 7 o'clock. But as soon as it got dark, she would yell, and we'd drag us back in again. But kids nowadays, they stay on their iPads, and it's way entertaining. Or they're being bullied on social media, and they have to defend themselves. And uh, it, there's t too many reasons. And these are 8, 10, 12, 13-year-old. I worry about them. Are they, when they finish college or they're started on their job of their life, are they going to make their health better, or is it going to be worse? And I worry about that. But the sedentary lifestyle is, is there. Frailty is when people become frail, and this is people usually in later stages of dementia, but you don't have to have dementia. Maybe you have some other medical condition, a neurologic condition, you know, your, your joints hurt or whatever. But where you start to get the muscles actually shrinking, the muscle is called sarcopenia, the muscles shrink and become smaller, physically smaller. And we've had men in our practice who start off at 220, and we're seeing them at age 78, and they're 150 pounds, ringing wet. And they're on a high-dose statin, and their bad cholesterol is like 45. And they're on a high-dose 80 milligrams of simvastatin. And uh, simvastatin causes muscle pain. And if you take away the muscle pain, you can exercise. When you can exercise, you can sleep better. When you sleep better, your muscles come back. And you need those muscles, because when you fall, you need to grab something to save yourself from hitting your head. And we've seen people fall. They don't even put their arms out. They just fall forward and flat on their face. And if your muscles are too weak to defend yourself in a fall, you're in trouble, because most of us are going to have a fall or two in our lives. But, um, this frailty is a risk factor. And once you get into the frailty, it's hard to break that cycle. But it's good if we could get a exercise physiologist to come to your door every day with a whistle and a clipboard and Bermuda shorts and 
make you exercise, but it's, it's hard to do, you know, when you're, you're in a routine. And a lot of times when you're the caregiver, it's so easy if they're just, they're not fussing about something, everything's quiet, or they're taking a nap, and it's easy to just ride on that. But the problem is their muscles aren't being built up if you don't have some exercise time during the day. So frailty is a big one. And stress, you know, you, we should talk in primary care. We were stressed out of our gourd. I was for 40 years, but I never felt stressed. I was, I mean, towards the end, I didn't feel stressed. When I was doing deliveries for 14 years, I felt stressed. Every time they called me in the middle of the night for a delivery, I felt stressed. But we just took it on the chops because that was part of the deal. But people live that way all the time, not just doctors. They have kids. Kids are all in three or four activities. You know, they're president of this and leader of that and doing all kinds of stuff. And when your adrenal gland is pumping out adrenaline and all the stress hormones all day long, those hormones overdo and hurt your brain, hurt your brain function. You can get the same effect by giving someone steroids all the time, and there are medical conditions for which steroids are indicated. It will hurt your brain. But if you make your own steroids by being stressed out of your gourd, you need to figure something out so that you're not so stressed. Hard to do. Um, health habits in general, smoking, it's interesting. We don't see many people smoking when they come to us. Almost all of them have quit smoking by the time they come to us. At least that's one thing we recognize as a bad actor, universally. High fructose corn syrup will get up there someday, but it's nowhere near the top. Right now we know smoking is pretty unusual. And people worry about, um, uh, well, the head injury. Uh, we do see a fair number of people have had traumatic brain injuries. And they fell out of a pickup truck or they got hit with a baseball bat. In, in the old days, we didn't do anything. We'd go stay on the couch for a few hours and mom would come in and say, do you have a headache? No, okay, you can go out and play. You know, I mean, uh, that was it. But we now know that all those head traumas and most kids have several of them by the time they leave home. Um, it's hard to say. And head trauma is interesting when it does damage. You can't tell by looking if it was damaging. We don't get the vote on whether it was damaging or not. Your brain decides if it was damaging. And if it was, it was. It doesn't matter what it looked like. And the simplest thing like a, a ball bouncing, a soccer ball bouncing off a goalie's head looks at easy, but it may cause some brain injury. And that's pretty important. So we're getting better about that in organized sports, particularly in schools. We're getting way better at the college level, the pro level. But if you look at the pro uh, football players, how many of them who play 10 years or more have uh, traumatic encephalopathy? It's alarming. It's very, very high. And those of us who were never privileged, privileged to play or those of us whose coaches never let them play, um, who, um, probably are better off in terms of their brain injury, brain um, dementia risk. So we have on our website, um, this is uh, something that Sarah Baker, our marketing person, created for us. And there's 47 questions in there. You can just go on our website and take the test. If your score is above 10, that'd be of concern. However, we need to redo this because since we published this, there's been about a handful, maybe 10 more risk factors that we're putting in. There's 47 questions, but it really asks about 100 risk factors, because if someone had to answer 100 questions, they would never do the test. So we snuck those in there. But um, there's a QR code that you could scan, and I think we have that on some of our materials there. But just go to our website, it's on there. Um, but we use that, and we think that anyone doing dementia care should do a dementia risk assessment. Any drug study where we're studying the effectiveness of a drug for dementia needs to clear the deck first, get everyone's risk factors down to as low as possible, and then do the study. Uh, but this risk uh, assessment, it should be become a routine for all dementia care. Um, I don't see that even in our biggest, our two biggest medical centers in the state do not do that, that I could tell. So um, thanks for attending, and we appreciate your attention today. 
we'll have some more questions uh, that we'll take uh, here currently. Um, hopefully, uh, we as a community will rise above uh, this issue by collaborating and helping. If you, uh, you don't need to be a dementia expert to help, we have opportunities for volunteering. Um, um, so as I said, we as a community need to deal with this. We need all the help we can get. We appreciate donations. We're going to ramp up. We're going to scale up and get bigger with the federal grant. And hopefully the federal grant will be able to enable us to hire uh, clinicians to do the work that we have volunteers doing now. And uh, I think the future looks good if we can get that done. We're miles ahead of where we were uh, in 2015 when we started this. Uh, but it does take a community. And talk things up. Talk dementia prevention up amongst your colleagues and friends. It should be common parlance that we talk about that. Like, we talk about smoking and how bad it is. Uh, but, you know, all these other dementia factors, they're kind of curious and interesting to talk about. But strike up a conversation get that going. Uh, please fill out the surveys. We count on feedback, and when we write for grants, we reflect the findings in the surveys, and they want to know what do the people want. And we need your comments in surveys. Certificates of attendance are available for those professionals that would like them. This event was certified for three hours of uh, continuing medical education for physicians, and many other professional groups will accept that certification as adequate. Um, this is a picture of us at the office uh, with our mission sign and some board members on the wall. And these are our contact numbers, and I think these exist also in some of your packet. But I want you to consider our caregiver conference October 26th. It's going to be at River's Edge Convention Center. And that center is mostly on caregivers, caregiver health, and caregiving behaviors, all that sort of thing. And that'll be October 26th. These were the books we gave away. And please follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Feel free to make a donation anytime you want. You can do it by scanning the QR code or just going to our website. These are people who have given us donations or um, helped us with large grants from Minnesota Board on Aging in particular and United Way. MedCycle Solutions was a sponsor today and Thrivent helped us with costs. Uh, Central Minnesota Council on Aging has sort of, I don't know, they're sort of like our um, big sister who got us going and helped us on our way and continue to give us advice and we're thankful. Minnesota Medical Association has helped us. We did get a grant for doing Zoom uh, from them and so forth. And then these are people who helped with the summit, the exhibitors, the planning committee, and the event support. We appreciate St. Paul Neighborhood Network for um, getting all our technology going. Uh, Jules Bistro provided the lunches. We paid for those. <laughs> St. Mary's Cathedral, we gave them a small amount of money so that we could all park there for free. And we're thankful to St. Mary's for doing that. And that's it. I'll leave this up. And thank you, Dr. Zook, for talking for three hours today. Yeah. Good old guy.